So it's wild to me, I guess, that we continue to accept, you know, like antidepressant medication with all of its potential side effects, especially with like no intention to ever have a plan to go off of it. And in fact, I treat a lot of individuals that specifically come to my office to see me because they want me to help them get off of antidepressants, right? They feel like they've been on them for years. They don't really feel like they're doing anything any longer but they're really nervous to get off of them. Hi, Nicole, thank you so much for being here. Can you please let people know a little bit about your work and kind of what brings you to this point in your life? And we'll go from there. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me. Huh. So I am a psychologist and I have been trained um, in integrative or functional approaches to the treatment of mental illness. And essentially what that means is that in addition to being aware of conventional approaches for treating mental illnesses, I'm also always studying um, complementary and alternative approaches. So complementary and alternative approaches kind of fall into a couple of different quadrants like mind-body therapies, nutritional therapies, energy therapies, environmental therapies. And so essentially, I'm just looking to create like holistic or more dynamic treatment plans for my clients. So in addition to providing traditional talk therapy or being supportive of uh, the use of psychiatric medications, also might be incorporating mind-body practices such as breath work, or mindfulness meditation or various other types of meditation, um, incorporating nutritional strategies. Oftentimes we're incorporating movement therapies. So traditional exercise that most of us t- tend to think of, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but also- It's shocking, um, isn't it? Yeah, it's shocking. <laughs> yes, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's shocking, right? To, to a lot um, of clients, how much of an impact movement can have on their emotional well-being or their mental health. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah, I guess I just couldn't resist there. Like, <laughs> it's amazing that we we sort of like, extra. I mean, wow, it's, it, exercise can help people. What a thought, you know. I know it's maybe a little bit different in the U.S. than in Canada, but anyway, I couldn't I couldn't help myself there. <laughs> but um, and so and so, what type of practice do you have? I guess like, how do you work with clients, or do you have a particular client base, or or? Yeah, so I have uh, I have a what we might think of as like a traditional outpatient clinic, um, and so I work with um, individuals who are kind of self-selecting to see a practitioner like myself, and they might come in and we'll do a traditional like biopsychosocial assessment, um, get a thorough history of you know what they've done up until this point to try to address their emotional health or to, uh, to try to heal. And then we kind of, like I said, I sort of offer them a holistic sort of treatment plan. Like what can we do in the realms of mind, body, and spirit to kind of address Mm -hmm. whether they be disruptions in emotion, disruptions like anxiety, depression, chronic stress, chronic physical illnesses that have psychological underpinnings or psychological components. Like for example, I do, um, I treat a lot of chronic gastrointestinal disorders because there's such a significant overlap between gastrointestinal health and mental health. Yeah. Can you tell, maybe just tell me a bit more about that in particular, like how does that show up and how do people kind of work through slash heal? Yeah. So when you think about um, gastrointestinal disorders, chronic gastrointestinal disorders like IBS, for example, like the research has shown Mm -hmm. that there's a very, there's a significant emotional component to the site, like kind of the maintenance of those physical symptoms. So there's such a sophisticated nervous system in our gastrointestinal Mm -hmm. system that if we're not simultaneously addressing uh, chronic stress, resulting inflammation, uh, permeability of uh, the gut wall, right? How much, you know, basically how much uh, flow of unhelpful bacteria is getting through that wall because of breakdowns in functionality of the of that wall. 
um, if we're not like kind of addressing a, that whole, like if we're not taking a holistic approach, if we're just focusing on like reducing gastrointestinal symptoms, whether that be pain or bloating, constipation, right? Like that whole cycle that oftentimes patients- Could it also in. be diarrhea? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I have a client actually mm -hmm. who's, who's <laughs> that's why as you were started talking about, I was like, oh, yeah. that's interesting. Let me learn a little bit more about that. Sorry. So it could be that as well. Yes. In fact, yeah. um, IBS has like two different distinctions, right? So it's okay. IBS with constipation or IBS with diarrhea. Okay. Wow. Well, so I was just going to say, yeah. so oftentimes I'll have patients who show up at my clinic who have um, seen multiple gastroenterologists and they've tried a lot of different medications. Uh, they tried a lot of different specialty diets, if you will. Like we do, you know, mm -hmm. we have a lot of functional providers who will offer like specific diets to follow. Like the, the FODMAP diet is one like in gastrointestinal health or anti-inflammatory diets or remove gluten or remove dairy or remove sugar. But if we're not, and those things can sometimes help, right? They can bring about some physical symptom relief, but um, it's oftentimes short lived unless you're also simultaneously addressing the like the role of chronic stress, subsequent like inflammation within the gastrointestinal system. Again, kind of like the breakdown within the, the gut, the communication between the gut brain barrier. So we work on developing strategies and therapy like we use um, different types of relaxation techniques specifically designed to like improve parasympathetic tone, right? So using kind of accessing the vagus nerve in order to improve parasympathetic tone and incorporating kind of intermittent strategies throughout the, like throughout an individual's day in order to kind of overall reduce inflammation load in the body. You know, I mean, I think when you're talking about inflammation, like you're looking at stress hormones, secretion of stress hormones into the system. So just, again, kind of taking an overall functional approach. Uh, so thinking about what's the root cause of the gastrointestinal upset. And maybe that kind of is a good segue into another thing you, with the mindfulness-based interventions. So I'm a, I've mm -hmm. done a lot of like, M, I assume you're familiar with mindfulness-based stress reduction. Um, yes. MBSR, yeah. Mm -hmm. and mindful self-compassion and some of these other practices, which I've done a lot of as a client, but also as a teacher. Um, I'm curious, I guess, just like how you see that or how you integrate that. And I'm not sure what it's like in the U.S. Uh, I do know mm -hmm. here you can sometimes get the government to pay for mindfulness based interventions, if it's provided by like an MD or a psychiatrist, mm -hmm. although that's exceedingly rare here, although it, it has happened. But I guess I'm just kind of curious how what, if you can respond to that, I guess it wasn't totally a question. But how, how do you how do you integrate the mindfulness stuff? So I think it would probably be similar here in the US that if an individual was fortunate enough to find a larger hospital system that's offering mm -hmm like an eight week formal MBSR yeah. training program that they could probably get their health insurance to pay for it if they had a diagnosis that would support that. Right. But those are probably few and far between um, like those offerings. So I incorporate mindfulness training into my individual therapy sessions. So we met basically, you know, we do um, a lot of med in session meditations, a lot of my therapy sessions tend to be like equal parts talk and experience, right? So I'm offering a lot of experiential work within the context of like the larger session. So we might be spending some time kind of like learning, like learning a new mindfulness skill and then practicing it in session, um, you know, uh, in conjunction with like traditional, you know, cognitive behavioral approaches to, to, you know, other things that the client is bringing up. Right. Can you give an example, or I'm curious your thoughts about with the, the IBS stuff, how you would help a person like that in particular with maybe CBT slash M, you know, mindfulness based things like 
I assume sort of there can be panic or anxiety around IBS, right? I'm out at school or I'm at work and all of a sudden my stomach starts, you know, freaking out kind of thing or my mind or whatever. How do you kind of address that? In the situation like you described, um, if you, if you were my client and you were telling me about like, this is something that happened. So we'd first talk about like the importance of um, not kind of tightening down around that pain right? So any type of physical pain sensation, whether it be a gastrointestinal pain or a pain in an extremity, uh, we increase the likely, like we increase our experience of that pain when we tighten down around it, when we resist it, right? So I often teach my clients like what we resist persists. Mm. So when you experience pain or sensation of pain in your stomach, right? Um, we probably do some, oh, I probably would teach them like a body scan, a brief body scan. Mm-hmm. So body scan meditation is one of the four main um, modalities within mindfulness-based stress reduction. And so I would teach them a body scan to try to help them like diffuse the, you know, to, to kind of diffuse their cognitions a little bit away from just the sensation of pain they might be experiencing by asking them to take in their entire body as opposed to just like their stomach. Cool. And, and how about the, the panic and the, the cognitions around worrying that something bad's going to happen? Yeah. So that to me feels like, like mindset work. So a lot of times Mm -hmm. I work with my clients to develop new mindsets or new lenses in which they experience themselves or their life. So in this case, like physical, uh, this is a chronic physical uh, element that they're experiencing. So we would kind of talk about like developing first separateness from thoughts. So being able to become more effective observer of their thoughts as and recognize um, the role of consciousness, right? In the experience of reality. So helping them to kind of unpack that they probably have a collection of automatic thoughts that continues to kind of feed this anxiety. And without a whole lot of discernment, they're continuing to kind of use the gift of consciousness to experience these thoughts and this subsequent reality over and over and over and over again. So kind of helping to teach them that, you know, our feelings are really nothing more than the measure of the quality of our thinking. So if we can, if we can get some distance from our feelings in the moment, we can start to get in better relationship with the thoughts that we're using to continue to perpetuate that feeling experience that we don't like. Great. And, and are you familiar with Sam Harris? Do you know who Sam Harris is? No, I don't think so. Okay sort of random question. He's a neuroscientist and philosopher from America. Very popular guy. He's got a huge podcast and an amazing meditation app, but he talks a lot about consciousness and the mind and all these things. Um, And you can get his products for free, which is what I always find him to be. Yeah. Yeah. It's sort of like, you know, the intentions are pure when this person is, and, and, it's world-class material, like lots of famous people on his app doing their own meditation courses. And so all the kind of big Western meditation people have been on there teaching courses. But I, I, I was sort of first introduced to the idea of consciousness and non, non-dual awareness and those kind of things through him. And I guess I'm curious, it's, sometimes it's hard to formulate the questions because I don't know exactly what they are. They're still floating in my head, but how come... <laughs> It may be the disconnection just between our sort of medicalized interpretation of human experience in the context of mental health or illness and perhaps how these more, I would say more traditional, they've been around for thousands of years, other kind of mind practice, mind consciousness practices are being integrated. And I know you kind of just described a bit of an example, but maybe like a bit more on the philosophy of it all and what you see kind of in the academic medical establishment. So I think one, I mean, I think philosophical, philosophically, one of the biggest differences between contemplative practices or meditative practices, right? Like these approaches that have sort of spiritual underpinnings as opposed Mm -hmm. to maybe like Western medicine or medicalized like interpretation is how they, uh, conceptualize symptoms. Mm-hmm. So I think in a like medical model, 
it's all about the symptoms, right? Like we, I mean, classically trained psychologists like myself are trained to help an individual like identify symptoms, right? Like it's a deficit-based model. So the conversations are keyed into helping the individual identify like deficits in their functioning, right? And then we highlight those deficits in functioning. And then oftentimes the work is so centered around like the symptoms and alleviating the symptoms that I believe we almost kind of reinforce an individual's relationship to their struggles or to their mental illness more than we actually like create space and the intentionality of healing. Hmm. So where I feel like more drawn and aligned uh, philosophically and theoretically with contemplative practices or meditative practices is this idea like that we are not our symptoms, right? Like I, I really love, love Ayurvedic medicine's interpretation of symptoms as, you know, kind of mess, like in an, our innate health way of kind of getting our attention, right? Like mm. that there's something that we need, something underlying here, something that we need to in, address. Mm. I really appreciate the idea that like symptoms are transient, right? Like that our, you know, that our human experience in and of itself, um, our emotions on any given day or, or the experience of symptoms we might be having can be transient and it is not a fixed experience. I think that if we're focused on just treating symptoms, then we're almost buying in that those symptoms are somewhat fixed and that that disruption in emotional well-being or mental illness is now a part of your identity where these uh, contemplative practices or theories that are derived from more spiritual theoretical underpinnings, I think, um, appreciate more that pain and suffering is oftentimes a part of the human experience, but it's not, it's, it's also intended to be tran like transient and we're to move through it. And what, and there's a uh, gosh, there's a cultivation of curiosity of what can we learn from that struggle? How can we grow as a result of these struggles? You know, it's, it kind of goes back to what I was saying about pain, right? Like we, we tightened down around physical pain, but the same goes for cognitive experiences. If we tighten down around like experience of ourself um, in our life, right? We end up getting stuck. We, there's really not a lot of opportunity for us to, to grow. So I feel like they're much more growth oriented concepts. Um, healing is a part of the conversation. I don't really feel like in my, in classical training, right? of the treatment of mental illnesses. I'm not sure that we're really ever having a conversation about healing or uh, somebody, you know, somebody yeah. actually like recovering, right. And, and, uh, and then sustaining emotional well being, like from, from that point on. Yeah. Yeah. And, and maybe you can give some insight on to how our sort of traditional psychiatric medication fits into this and maybe a, a, a little added question would be, I, I have a brother, he lives with schizophrenia and mm -hmm. for him, the psychiatric med, particularly the antipsychotics clearly help, right? When he's mm -hmm. not taking that, he's really unwell. Yet those are distinctly different from the SSRI stuff and the, and the antidepressants, anti-anxiety, all those other kind of meds. And I, I find it just, I try to be curious about how, <laughs> how we got here and how we're going to move forward. And I don't know if you're familiar with, um, Dr. I can't remember his name. Anyway, there was a paper in science a couple of years ago that reminded everybody and smashed the illusion that we, there's a chemical imbalance in the brain. And if you just treat it with SSRIs, everything's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. And it was a huge paper um, from large academic institutions that just, again, reminded people of how poorly documented and proven these theories are. And then even with all that known, I had a client the other day who a young person was in hospital and got given the spiel from a psychiatrist in the hospital that he has a chemical imbalance in his brain and that he needs to take SSRIs to balance that out. And it just, it's, it's tricky. Um, and mm -hmm. I'm curious what your thoughts, I know that was a lot in that kind of story there, but maybe if you can go through it as best you can, that would be great. <laughs> yeah. So I guess the first thing that kind of jumps out at me is this idea that um, like chemical imbalance in the brain and the support, like supporting the use of SSRIs, um, because 
99% of our serotonin receptors are actually located in our gastrointestinal system. Mm -hmm. So it can't possibly just be a single a chemical mm -hmm. imbalance in the brain, right? Is it, you know, we, I think we really need to be curious about the role of those serotonin receptors in the gastrointestinal system and the functionality of them, right? I think a lot of times it comes down to not denying that there isn't maybe something that isn't working properly within the body, but to be more curious about like the functionality of our systems. So uh, yeah, there was kind of a, there was a lot there to go yeah. after. So can I, I think, <laughs> wait, sorry, sorry. Can I stop you for one second about the serotonin yeah. in the gut thing? Cause that's super interesting. Maybe. Um, yeah. Yeah. Can you just talk a bit more about that and then how might people address that? Right. How do we help our guts have more serotonin? I don't know if that's the right way to say it, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I recently attended a continuing education, right? Like more diving deeper into gut brain health and the role of the gut in mental health. And I thought the presenter was really wise to point out that the research in this area is only about 10 years old. And in, in the realm of research, that's like a newborn baby, right? So we know very little about the gut microbiome, the flora, the balancing of flora. We're doing a lot of, re I think there's a lot more research being done. Like as we learn more, the relationship between the gut and the brain and the nervous system in the gut. And again, the gut microbiome. So we, we hear a lot about probiotics and prebiotics and we're being marketed to heavily to take these kinds of supplements or to attend to our gut health. And I think there is a lot of like merit there. We do need to attend to our gut health and we do need to understand how environmental toxins and the plethora of environmental toxins that we're encountering on every given day, just in our everyday products and in the way we've changed the way we produce our food, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, how that's affected kind of our gut health and how we do have a lot of imbalance in the gut. And if we have imbalance of good and bad bacteria, we're going to have good and bad bacteria in the gut, no matter what. That's what we need. But if the if the balance isn't as it should be, then it would compromise our like our body's ability to derive nutrients from the foods that we mm -hmm. eat. And when we talk about the presence of 99 percent of our serotonin receptors being in the gut, it would be important then that our gut like would have good integrity, right? For that functionality. So I think it's about looking for, looking out to see like how many environmental toxins am I exposed to? What's my, you know what? I often tell my clients, like, just keep track of your, like your gut health for a month. Most people don't even pay attention to it, right? Just kind of take a look, like what color is your stool? Like what shape is your stool? Kind of document that for about 30 days. It start, it'll start to give you a little bit of an insight or a picture of like, how is my like gut health? What is going on in that, you know, that invisible part of my system, right? And then thinking about, you know, where you might be prone to uh, be exposed to more toxins, you know, because that's a lot of what the research says, like, well, our guts get kind of thrown off because we're exposed to a lot of toxins and the body's not able to rid itself of them effectively. And that compromises the whole system, and then we have secretion of bad bacteria into the bloodstream and on and on it goes. Um, right. Uh, can I ask you, uh, I know yeah. we're sort of pulling away from my initial, initial long conversation. <laughs> we'll get or long question. Mm -hmm. We'll get back. What I know it's all individual, although are there general themes for, or places where people can generally start to address the gut health? Is it, antibiotics. I know you kind of said a little bit about that. Is it more of this food, less of that food? Are there any kind of staple starting points? Well, I mean, so you mentioned antibiotics and if you've had a history, that's one place that you could also look for a red flag for yourself. Like if you've had a history or your child has had a history of ear infections or strep infections, things that have been treated with multiple antibiotics, Mm -hmm. we now can feel pretty confident saying like we've probably thrown off like the gut flora, right? We probably need to do some things to restore that. I think for the same reason that we rely so much on antidepressants in our healthcare system, it's almost the same reason that I suggest like for most people, me offering up a specific 
dietary plan that requires them to eat certain types of vegetables um, or eat in a certain way, that's oftentimes really challenging, right? It's often easier for them to just to try to eat prebiotic foods, foods that are like higher in fiber, and then take a probiotic supplement, right? Because I feel like the reason why we are so open to taking the SSRI is because the more functional or holistic approaches to healing depression require a certain amount of self-monitoring, self-management, initiation, persistence, <laughs> goal-oriented right. behavior. Like I think, yeah. I think those are things that are kind of hard for a lot of us. Yes, especially yeah. with all the demands that we have, right, in our modern lives. So, although I will still say that I don't necessarily think that the antidepressant should be most individuals with depression and anxiety's first choice. But if I'm answering your question about where should I start, if I suspect that my gastrointestinal system is probably not as strong as I would like it to be, it's probably not as efficient. That's probably the best word, like efficient. Mm. It's efficiency in the gastrointestinal system. How good is it at driving the micronutrients from the foods that I'm eating, right? And how how, um, balanced is it? So I would say, yeah, you know, eating as much as many whole foods as we can, right? So like not avoiding a lot of pro- like processed foods because you're going to get a lot of your like prebiotics, your prebiotic fibers from those types of foods and, and maybe investing in a good probiotic. Cool. And I always say, you know, I, I always say as far as supplements are concerned, um, there are certain supplements that I use in my practice, but I always, you know, encourage my clients like, Companies that develop supplements and then they put them in trials, they put them in research trials, to me, says something about like that they are standing behind their product, right? So I always look for when I'm looking for supplements, I look to see like, are they doing research on their supplement or was it just developed, you know, like kind of was it just developed basically to complement this provider's like website and their approach? And so then this supplement's just being like sold in conjunction with, you know, like the program that they offer. You know, I'm not necessarily saying that all of those supplements um, are ineffective, but I do think that I look for supplements companies that are putting their supplements in randomized controlled trials um, for, you know, to treat specific illnesses and, then those are the supplements that I tend to go for. Okay. And I know maybe we can just circle back a little bit to the SSRI chemical imbalance stuff and then maybe get into kind of our modern life, social media anxiety catastrophe Mm -hmm. going on. Mm -hmm. Uh, But yeah, yeah, so, so yeah, the SSRI thing, I just find it so strange that that has gone on for so long the evidence is not there yet. We continually just hand these things to people. And, Oh, that was one other piece. Sorry. Is the, what the research also showed was the thousands of papers on, or, or whatever studies on getting people onto SSRIs Mm -hmm. and SNRIs, but there literally is maybe I think 20 or 30 papers on getting people off them effectively. (laughs) And this idea of, Uh, what do they call it? Uh, Hyperbolic tapering and how when you taper people off the traditional way, oftentimes the symptoms of withdrawal mimic the symptoms of the illness. And then the doctor or psychiatrist goes, Oh, look, see, you have, you still have depression and anxiety. You better stay on. So that's, yeah. 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 Yeah, I think it's, I think that it's unfortunate that we use SSRIs as much as we do, right? Like you said, there's a lot of um, research that's been done. Let's just put it this way. Um, In mild to moderate cases of depression and anxiety, which is the lion's share of the population that is taking SSRIs, SSRIs are no more effective than placebo. And in the few studies that we've been able, (laughs) the few studies that we've been able to get approved and conducted show us that, that movement, that movement, if that exercising, right? Like that we can actually get the same antidepressant effect through movement. So it's wild to me, I guess, that we continue to accept, you know, like antidepressant medication with all of its potential side effects and 
uh, especially with like no intention to ever have a plan to go off of it, right? Like, I mean, I I know very few prescribing providers who engage my clients in conversations about, so this medication is designed to be used for six months. Let's help it get you behaviorally activated. Let's help it get you moving. Let's help it get you into therapy on a consistent basis to work on some of the underlying, you know, maybe mindsets or belief systems or the underlying trauma or whatever the trigger might have been like, Mm -hmm. and then we'll like kind of slowly move off of the medication. That's really never a part of the conversation. I feel like it's just the, the medication is given and then it's up to the client. And in fact, I treat a lot of individuals that specifically come to my office to see me because they want me to help them get off of antidepressants, right? They feel like they've been on them for years. They don't really feel like they're doing anything any longer, but they're really nervous to get off of them. What if my body doesn't know how to make serotonin anymore on its own? What if, right? Like if it's a dope, what if it doesn't know how to make dopamine anymore? Yeah. So, yeah. so I'm not sure about the imbalance in the, you know, the imbalance in the brain conversation. Maybe that just feels like it's a more digestible conversation to have with a, like a patient before prescribing that medication. But the way I've been trained is that, is that the mind and body are always in communication with one another. So um, any disruption and functionality that we have physically, there's a cognitive or mental component to that. And any mental disruption that we have is kind of signaling and sending information to the body and that it's undermining like physical functionality. So I don't think that it's just, it could just be one imbalance, you know, there's a chemical imbalance in the brain, right? Even if I was to buy into that, I would wanting to be have a conversation about how you're meant, like what you're doing with your thinking and how your body's responding to your thinking is kind of continuing to support that imbalance in the brain. Right. But I've always been taught that it it's about efficiency again. How efficient is our body at essentially performing the chemistry experiments that it needs to in order to make enough serotonin available to the brain, enough dopamine available to the brain to convert epinephrine to norepinephrine so it could be used in a functional way, right? I've always been taught that this is that, you know, again, kind of intern our biochemistry is like this internal chemistry experiment where we need certain micronutrients So when we talk about serotonin, we need B vitamins and we need activated folic acid in the form of L-methylfolate. We need certain trace minerals like magnesium and zinc. We need tryptophan proteins to be converted to 5-HTP, right? Like that there's a chemistry experiment that's actually occurring within our system in order to make enough serotonin available to our brain in order to maintain and balance out our emotionality. So I'm looking for where there might be breakdowns in that um, in that experiment, if you will, right? Like, so I'm curious about somebody's, well, I'm always curious about somebody's nutrition, how they're fueling their body, what they're eating, right? And so when we talk about, you know, you talk about depression symptoms, you look for, I'm looking for kind of red flags as to where I might be feeling like, I don't know if this person is getting enough of these vital micronutrients in order for their body to make serotonin efficiently on its own. Or again, I might be looking for like, maybe they're eating, they're eating lots of fruits and vegetables. They tell me they eat a really good diet, right? But they have a tremendous amount of um, stress in their life, right? And they have a tremendous amount of um, disruption that might make it hard within the gastrointestinal tract for them to actually like, secrete those micronutrients from the foods that they're eating. Or we've learned about certain gene markers that make it difficult for individuals to um, methylate, basically methylation, like difficulty with methylation. So that's the idea of taking um, folic acid and converting it to L-methylfolate in order for it to be available in the form that it needs to be available in for the process of creating serotonin. So if we're, if we have struggle struggles with methylation, right? Like how do we get methylation support? So, you know, being curious about methylation and the role of methylation support, being curious about diet and the role of um, like micronutrients and the availability of micronutrients for the successful 
conversion of serotonin, like those things to me, all, I put all of that ahead of like per, giving somebody an antidepressant because I think that it really reinforces this idea of like our health exists outside of us, right? It's the, right. the ultimate externalization of our health, our mental health, right? Like your, your, your he- mental health is dependent upon like something that you get from outside of you. And I think that, you know, as an innate health practitioner, I'm always wanting to reinforce to my clients that like your, your health exists within you. It's within the ex- like the internal locus of your control and how can I support you in, you know, trying some, trying some different things, trying different things, dietary wise, moving, um, moving your body a little bit more regularly, um, getting enough sleep. You know, there's so many, (laughs) there's so many, um, like we make ourselves so, so vulnerable, I think, to having inefficient systems when it comes to like, the biochemistry necessary for balanced mood and emotionality because of the lifestyles that we live. Yeah. Maybe you could, can you talk about a little bit, maybe about that in particular sort of modern living, why everyone is so anxious. Some of the data out of the U S is pretty interesting uh, where sort of particularly with Gen Z never been, basically it's, people have never been so anxious and depressed ever. (laughs) And simultaneously we have the most amounts of antidepressants in our population and Mm -hmm. it doesn't seem to be going anywhere. And then we have these gadgets, our phones, our social media Mm -hmm. that are causing disruptions and all of this as well. Mm -hmm. And yeah, kind of maybe you can just talk about that a little bit and then can kind of go from there. Yeah. So I guess one thing that I'm always curious about when I see like the epidemic levels, if you will, of depression and anxiety is the role of like reducing the stigma surrounding mental illness or, or mental health, right? Like what's the correlation? Is there a correlational relationship between like increased conversation, increased information, right? Media, there's been, there's so much more talk about mental health and mental illness, if you will, like post COVID than there ever was before. And I know that the depression, anxiety rates have been on the rise before COVID, but certainly, you know, they have spiked since COVID. But I guess I wonder about patho, like how much we're pathologizing the human experience, how much as we continue to give more language and we needed it. I mean, I absolutely am an advocate for reducing the stigma around addressing, talking about mental struggles with mental health or mental illness, get, getting resources into co- every community, um, helping people to feel like to feel less stigmatized when they seek services from somebody like myself. But what I worry about is that because we have, how, because we have kind of a pathologized healthcare system, a deficit-based healthcare system, that now we're almost pathologizing the human experience. That symptomology that is synonymous with depression and anxiety that should be occur that we should be considering as occurring on a continuum of severity is now all getting kind of lumped into like everybody has just one set of language for talking about these symptoms within the realm of their human experience. And so they're labeling themselves as depressed and they're labeling themselves as anxious. So (laughs) those are, that's kind of the first thing that comes to mind for me when I think about like, I'm not trying to say like, do we really have these epidemic levels? But I'm really trying to say, I think we need to, I think we need to also provide health based language. I think we need to also provide language that, normalizes a certain amount of disruption in emotional well-being at different points in time throughout our life. That it's unrealistic to expect that we would go through our entire life, experience all the transitions that we experience, experience all the struggles and change and everything that's a part, like a larger part of living and not expect that from time to time, we might not feel a little bit anxious or we might not have you know, a low mood that we might associate, you know, with depression. Um, 
And I particularly worry about this with young people. I really, really worry about this with young people because I think that um, I think that they've just been fed so much mental illness based language that their level of tolerance they have for any disruption in emotional well-being is so low that it sends them right off to their provider, which is oftentimes like their, you know, a pediatrician or, or a primary care provider, right? The de facto, you know, prescribers of mental health medication and they're given medication. Yeah. That's a really nice description of what's happening. <laughs> or, or in, and I do think there is a, I told you a little bit earlier, I was part of this, and destigmatize whatever anti stigma mm -hmm. campaign thing through our biggest mental health hospital. And there's a huge push. There has been a huge push for all of that. Certainly it's having an impact on young people's interpretation of their experience and symptoms. And then, as you say, they run off to the doctor and then they're given a medication. It's almost become glamorized on social media a little bit as well in certain mm -hmm. ways. I, I guess I, I am curious how you understand that process, sort of the impact of social media and smartphones on kind of this perpetuation of normal human experience into a disorder. And it's certainly messing with kids, no doubt. It's probably messing with the adults too, but more so yeah. the kids. So it's it feels a little bit like, I mean, in terms of messaging that they're being fed, that I think is inten the intention of it is to reduce the stigma, as you said, right? Anti-stigma, um, get kids talking about their mental health, nor trying to normalize, right? Like that, you know, so that they seek out support when they need it, right? Or that they know how to support a friend who might be struggling. Um, but I, like I said, I, I worry that they rely so heavily on that information that they receive through like through their smartphone that if we're not, you know, if we're not giving, if we're not kind of balancing out the pathology, the pathologizing and the pathology driven messages with the health and restoring health right, and, right. you know, providing like effective co uh, emotion focused coping skills development, right? Like I feel like we need equal parts identifying and labeling equal parts, identifying and labeling with empowering and educating. I feel like we're missing a lot of the empowering and educating that would, <laughs> that would really allow young people to say, you know, yeah, I'm feeling a little bit anxious today, but I've, I've got tools that I can use, right? I sometimes feel like, as you said, it's kind of glamorized, right? Like, oh, I'm, you know, I mean, I'm feeling this way. So I put it out there and I solicit kind of empathetic feedback from my peers, right? And that's kind of what I'm using as, um, I guess, my way of coping, right? The amount mm -hmm. of empathetic feedback I receive or who actually provides that feedback. Yeah. And can you, I think there's a decent segue here with the, so, so one of the reasons I no longer have social media at all, other than YouTube, which isn't mm -hmm. really, doesn't mm -hmm. totally fit the bill, is just the, the experience of automatic comparison. You can't, yes. our, our brains, you often hear things, I think I saw something on YouTube the other day by this large YouTube mental health channel, uh, how to stop comparing yourself to other people or something like that. And my... I guess my mindfulness training jumps a bit at that. It's saying you can't ever stop comparing yourself to other people because that's what our brain does. It, mm -hmm. it, it functions that way. So maybe it's pedantic or whatever, but it's not so much that we stop comparing ourselves to other people. It's when we do and when we notice that, then what do we do kind of idea? Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and maybe, I guess, can you kind of maybe talk a bit about how social media, adolescent brain, social comparison, all that kind of stuff interact and maybe how you help people in that context? Yeah. So I think that, I, I guess I worry about the extensive use of social media in adolescence because of the overlap of like the introduction of social media with the psychosocial stage of development of identity versus role confusion, 
right? And mm. so if you think before we had carried around devices with us all the time, and before we were receiving all this external stimuli about who we should be and what we should like and how we should dress and, you know, every other facet of, of who we are, right? We, I feel like we did a lot of that sourcing internally, right? Like mm. we, we thought, you know, we looked within ourselves and like, what do I feel an affinity for? What do I feel like I want to do today? What do I feel like I want to explore? What do I feel? What hobbies do I want to take up? Right? Like, how do I want to dress? Right? And certainly within identity versus role confusion within that psycho stage, stage of development, like you're, there is a lot of fluidity, right? There is a lot, of, there should be some opportunity for exploring that, right? And um, trying out different things and trying out different extracurriculars or different hobbies or you know, switching up your friend group, right? Like that's a healthy part of that developmental phase. I worry that with the so much social media and so much media influence on who we are and how we develop that we don't really get a good sense of ourselves internally. I oftentimes talk to young people about like, we want to strive to be living inside out and not outside in. When we live our lives inside out, it's like we're accessing our our inner our instincts, our intuition, our gut instincts, if you will, right? Like terms or ways of thinking about like having our rightness stored within us that we kind of move away from when we externalize so much of our self worth, so much of our self love, right? So I think you know when we think about like toddlers and young kids, and elementary age kids, kids before they don't really have a whole, they don't have access to social media platforms and the internet and smartphones and all that external stimuli. A lot of times they're living truly inside out. They're thinking about what they want to do and where they want to go, and what they, right. And they, then they decide what they're going to do. But when we use, when we engage these platforms and we start like comparing ourselves, as you said, to other people, we start looking to see like, at you know, what, what other people are doing, how they're living their life, how they're dressed, then we've, we've shifted to more outside in living, right? So I'm looking at what's outside of me, and I'm bringing that into myself. And so I may not even feel I may not even like what I'm doing, or what I'm wearing, or how I'm talking, or how I'm behaving, but I feel like that's how I should behave. And I feel like it really disrupts that psychosocial stage of development of identity versus role confusion. I think a lot of young people are coming out of that stage of development more confused than ever because they didn't really have the opportunity to spend time in the quietness of their instincts and their intuition to pursue activities and interests and friendships, relationship development, right? From an, like an, a most authentic and organic place. It was all socially derived for them. Yeah. Uh, you just sort of gave me a bit of a eureka moment where I've been very much following along the, I love, I, I've never heard it put that way. I think you said, what was it? Ro identity confusion with. Identity development versus role confusion. Right. And, yeah. and how, you know, not, we don't need to go down that, the pathway, but the whole, you know, with gender and sexuality and et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, our kids are just being spun up uh, the adults too, into so much confusion and, and unhelpful stuff mm -hmm. under, in my opinion, under the guise of compassion, which also in my opinion, makes it even more sinister. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Can you maybe just clarify for people again the difference between <laughs> i forgot it already identity role confusion with identity can you can can you really kind of hammer in on that and i want to write it down so i don't forget yeah so identity yeah. so psycho stage psychosocial stage of development identity versus role confusion so right. it's like the development right. of your identity so it's really at a time where you're supposed to question um like your morals and your values, you question kind of the morals and values that were given to you by your family system. And you explore your interests and you explore deeper relationship development, right? Like, so what's going on in that stage of development is, you know, a lot of like, well, I was always told it should be this way, but what if it was right, this way? Right, what if I did right. this? What if I chose to believe this? What if I 
felt this way about religion versus what I was told within, right? So this, this is really normal, healthy sort of developmental exploration of oneself and one's identity, right? And, and the whole idea is that when you come, you know, when you successful, like successfully navigating that stage of psychosocial development, should you give you a clear identity? This is who I am, right? This is my core value set. This is, these are my interests. These are the types of people that I like to have in my life and the, and the relationships that I choose to keep. Right. And it, and it begins sort of like it's, it's the starting point for then choosing sort of like the next trajectory. Right. So, cause it starts to line up age wise with whenever we're picking more classes for ourselves and kind of like making decisions about college and making decisions about what, you know, what types of careers we might want to pursue. Right. And so the idea being that we should do that kind of exploration. We should question what we've been told is the truth from the time we were very little at some point in time in our life and make sure it matches up with what instinctually we feel we are and who we are. That process, I believe, before we had all this external stimuli, just con- I mean, there was external stimuli before, but it sure, wasn't but the kind near. of yeah. nowhere near what it is now, right? Yeah. That process before we had all this external stimuli oftentimes involved a lot of self-reflection, a lot of time, you know, thinking about like interacting and then thinking about, you know, having an experience and thinking about it and, and, you know, making, taking healthy risks, right? Now, you know, it's so, again, we are outsourced so much of what we decide is good and what we decide is valuable and what we decide is right and what we think is cool and what we think we should be that we don't really spend a whole lot of time like in self-reflection. In fact, we might even reject our most authentic self. If our most yeah. authentic self, like if our most authentic self is in contrast to the people we follow on Instagram or the people that we engage with on social media platforms, now we, we're rejecting our most authentic self. Yeah. So So I think that's where I, yeah, I feel like that's where, Mm -hmm. you know, social media being inter being allowing social media to be introduced into, into like tweens and adolescent, you know, teenage, I I feel like it presents a little bit of a liability to their, uh, to their development, their psychological development. I mean, there's also, you know, there's lots of different, lots of research that suggests that there are many things we should be concerned about developmental developmentally, but from a psychosocial developmental perspective, that's kind of where I see like that it sort of is um, it's a liability for that essential psychosocial stage of development of identity versus role confusion. And I think all parents should be curious about that. They should all be thinking like, I don't know, is this really something that I should be giving my kid? (laughs) Indeed. (laughs) I, I think, are you familiar with Jonathan Haidt and Jean Twenge? They're two really well-known yeah. re- academics. Um, I think they do some really wonderful work in all this area. I'm mm-hmm. curious, as our also as our time winds down, yeah, maybe you can tie in a little bit about, I was thinking about sort of the, we talked a bit about earlier about the contemplative practices, these more wisdom, spiritual practices, and oftentimes the, Well, I would argue the underlying, a underlying teaching is to notice the illusory nature of identity itself. Mm -hmm. And I think we, we, we so reinforce our attachment to identity. And I think, I guess maybe how, how do you think about that idea, right? Of this idea of the self and the me behind my face and this contracted version of Mike as with all its Mm -hmm. identities and roles and and et cetera, with the contemplative practice of recognizing that as an illusion in some sense in our mind and in our experience with, do you know, uh, Jack Cornfield, I love, he says this thing, we need to Mm -hmm. remember our Buddha nature and our social security number. (laughs) So, you know, (laughs) yeah. We, we, yeah. It's like the paradox, right, of no the no self with the mm-hmm. self that has to exist in the world, mm-hmm. and 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 as you say, or what I think you were saying is, all of this external seeking for identity or or ego gratification or whatever it is that's going mm-hmm. on just makes such a mess of it. And is it mm-hmm. possible? Do you think to help people in our 
modern so uh what's the word they it's often used the culture war kind of crap and mm -hmm. all this stuff going on is it do you think it's useful and practical to for people to understand the illusory nature of identity and i hope that wasn't too much <laughs> and makes sense that question yeah well i think a couple of things sort of stirred in me as you were talking so one is in almost all contemplative practices, right? There's this concept of attachment or non-attachment, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that the earlier we can be introduced to, to the value of like non-attachment and the recognition of how attachment kind of fuels and feeds our suffering, right? Like the, the better off we would be if we could start to develop um, a practice, you know, some type of practice, right? Some type of daily practice, like a meditative practice or a prayer practice or a reflection practice, journaling practice, something that is kind of reinforced this idea that cultivating non-attachment, right? Yeah. I feel like that could be really helpful in helping us to stay kind of open, like a little bit more open-minded and a little bit more available for, for, the human experience that we're intended to have instead of the human experience that we're trying to contrive, hmm. right. Or force. Mm -hmm. I also, I also had kind of stirring in me that the idea my, in mindfulness, the mindfulness quality of curiosity. I just don't think we're curious enough anymore about things that exist outside or on the fringe of what we're being fed. Right. Like that if we could. And I think that curiosity kind of goes like goes nicely with non-attachment. Right. Like this idea yeah, of, yeah. you know, of cultivating more curiosity and allowing for, you know, like that. I think curiosity allows for like more fluidity in both, you know, like in the development of our own identity, our ability to kind of pivot and move in new directions to in, within our life to be more flexible, to be not unattached. So I'm not sure if that really answers your question, but when I was hearing you, mm -hmm. those two things kind of came up for me, right? Like the value of non-attachment and to develop a practice or routine in which you're you know, kind of practicing those principles of non-attachment, curiosity, even beginner's mind, right? Another very classic mm -hmm. mindfulness quality, right? Yeah. Experiencing things as if you hadn't experienced, it's as if the first time you've experienced them in order to be more present. Um, I think it's the lack lack of presence. <laughs> okay. And maybe just in the last couple minutes, um, mm -hmm. anything else we didn't discuss that you think is important or need to discuss. And then if people want to learn more about you, uh, how they find you and that information will be in our show notes as they often say, so okay. people can find you there, but yeah, anything yeah. else kind of that you want to mention and, and how people can follow up with you. Um, no, I don't think so. I think it was a pretty good conversation. Um, we talked a good, we talked a couple different times about like the overuse of antidepressants. And yeah. I guess I want to just mention like a, I, maybe you've read this book, but it came up for me and it did, we didn't talk about it, but Lost Connections by Johan Hari. Have you ever read oh, that book? Yes, yes, I have. No, I haven't read it, but I, I am familiar with him and he does great yes. work for sure. Yeah. Yes. But I think it's a really good book to help um, shed more light on like the overuse of antidepressants and really what the research is saying. Like he's a journalist. He did, I feel like he does, does a really good job of kind of digging into some of the white papers that have yet, like they'll never get published basically um, related to antidepressant use. But, but other than that, no, I appreciate the conversation. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Likewise. Thank you so much. And um and, and people, maybe just your website or if people want to learn more about you, again, yes. it'll be in the show notes, but you can always just mention it. Sure, yeah. So my website is nativeclinics.com and you can find me. There's a link um, on nativeclinics.com to my email. If you have questions okay. about my approach, you could certainly email me or get in touch. Okay, wonderful. I am very grateful that you watched to the end of this video. Please click one of the boxes to watch more of our content and otherwise have a great day. Peace out.